My topic is the future of skills, uh, and it is a huge and complex and uncertain topic. Uh, this is a vision from 1964 of what 2020 would be like. So this reinforces the uncertainty and inexact science that is predicting the future. And this is a simplified snapshot of the skills system. Now, in any talk where I use PowerPoint, I do try and commit one, at least one crime against PowerPoint. And this is it, because of course you can't read the slide, but it's meant to emphasize the fact that skills is a, is a complex topic. And so we've got an uncertain future, a complex topic, and an increasingly turbulent environment. I didn't realize there is now an acronym to describe our current environment, VUCA, V-U-C-A. Has anyone come across that? So it's uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So what can I add to that vast topic? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the data and some of the evidence that we use to inform our policy and make some suggested recommendations. But before I do that, I just wanted to talk about uh, one of the biggest influences and biggest disruptors to the world of work and skills, which is the combination of robotics, artificial intelligence and automation. And occasionally it feels like science fiction is, is coming true. And as with any science fiction, there are both utopian and dystopian visions. So dystopian visions and headlines include robots are coming for your job and they're com coming sooner than you believe. Um, and also when robots have taken all of your jobs, remember the Luddites. So to balance against that apocalyptic vision, I just wanted to mention the story that I do like, which is a story about Steve the security robot. Does anyone know about this story? Okay, good. Steve was a security robot in Washington, D.C. that was invented to take away the mundane and boring tasks from the police, like providing information and just um, keeping track of various areas. So Steve was given the, the really tedious work to do. And Steve worked okay for a little while until Steve became a little bit erratic um, and decided to drive himself into a pond. <laughs> there Steve is. Now, obviously, people claimed that Steve found the work so boring uh, <laughs> that... Uh, he ended his existence, and indeed, they created a little shrine <laughs> to poor Steve. Uh, now, the point of this story is that I think it'll be a little while before Steve start taking over the world, just to balance the apocalyptic vision. But what you want to hear is about the impact of this on jobs. Do you recognize who this is? Okay. And she has a job as a massage therapist. And this is highly relevant to the topic of robotics and work, which I will come to in a moment. But what I wanted to talk about um, was some colleagues from MIT Sloan School of Management did a study that looked at over 900 occupations, over 2,000 work activities, and over 18,000 uh, work tasks. And they wanted to see which tasks were susceptible to machine learning and automation. And what they found was that almost every occupation had at least one task that was susceptible to automation. But almost no jobs could be totally automated. So the point was, the impact of automation will be huge, but it won't necessarily decimate jobs. And the question is, what is the one job that is least susceptible to automation? <laughs> Massage therapist. So should we all become massage therapists? <laughs> and the answer is no. It's no because jobs with higher level skills are at a far less risk of automation than other jobs, and research has shown this. And the second reason why we shouldn't all become massage therapists is there is huge demand for high level skilled jobs. Between 1986 and 2006, 85% of the jobs that were created were professional jobs that graduates usually go into and enroll high-level skills. And between 2008 
and 2018 that rose to 90 percent of the new jobs and this demand is set to grow so the CBI does an annual survey of all its members and it asks them what will be your demand for high level skill in the next high level skills in the next three to five years and consistently two-thirds of firms have said they expect an increase in demand and the other thing we need to remind ourselves of is with an aging population there is a huge need for replacement recruitment to replace people who've retired and it's estimated that between 2016 and 2026 13.1 million jobs will need to be filled to make up for this retirement so there's huge demand there so what skills will be needed this is work from the bank of england and this shows that there are three types of skills that are will be increasingly in demand technological skills social and emotional and interpersonal skills and high level cognitive skills now these are the sort of skills that are like analytical thinking critical thinking problem solving all skills that graduates should be learning in their undergraduate education and increasingly people will want will want to see combinations of these skills so another question is what sort of learners will we need have people heard of the t and m model of learning this is something i've mercil mercilessly nabbed from a nesta presentation last week um, and what this seeks to demonstrate is the top of the T, the horizontal of the T, is your breadth of knowledge. And the vertical of the T is your specialism. So a T shows a career where you focus a lot on the specialism and you probably just have the one career. Medicine would be an example, and it's a traditional model. And the M seeks to represent the fact that you will have multiple different jobs, potentially multiple different careers, and what is important to employers, what is as important to employers as a specialist knowledge is your ability to move from career to career and learn and develop. And this also follows the predicted pattern of the number of careers, the number of career changes people will have in the future. So it means that um, the importance of lifelong learning skills and the variety of roles and specialisms that people will have become increasingly important. So what conclusions can we draw from this? I've got a list. So the first one is there is demand for high level skilled roles. And we should have three cheers for the humanities because research has shown, uh, Nesta and Pearson have shown that with the increased emphasis on the top of the T and the breadth, Degrees that give that breadth, such as English, history, philosophy, do provide the skill set that will lead to success in the future and help these sort of careers. So is the subject no longer important? Well, of course it is for a lot of different areas, such as medicine, which I mentioned earlier. But for employers, the ability of people to learn different subjects will be as important as the subject itself. So this lifelong learning idea is extremely important. And one thing that we should bear in mind is that we should try and ensure that the first M is the experience of university. And it leads to consecutive and effective uh, moving along the M's, if you like. And one thing that helps support this is work experience because work experience brings the first M if that's university closer to the other M's because with lifelong learning we will need employers who think more like learners and learners who think more like employees the other message that I wanted to end on was um, employers are looking for more than just the degree so they are looking for the soft skills that we've talked about that were mentioned in the Bank of England research, um, the interpersonal skills, the communication skills to supplement the subject knowledge and thinking and analytical skills that have been developed in relation to that. Um, ideally, they will also have work experience. Um, 
But also what people are looking for is in this changing world where people have to travel along the M's, they are looking for people who are flexible and resilient as well. And if you combine all of those, you will succeed in the future world of skills. Thank you.